Uh, good morning. Going to uh, carry on with Matthew, Matthew chapter 2, and we'll just start uh, as usual with, with a word of prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we come before you because we love you and we love your Son. And we're here, Father, because we want to understand more of him. And we pray, Father, therefore, that you will open our eyes to these words that you inspired so long ago, that they might truly make your Son and the things around and concerning your Son live again in our eyes. And help us, Father, that we might take him with us, that we might have the Spirit of Christ, without which we are none of his. We pray, Heavenly Father, then, for your guidance as we study, and as we reflect, and as we seek to take him with us in this world. For his sake we ask this. Amen. Okay, Matthew chapter 2, then, verse 1. Behold, they came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Now, these were probably Jews, I suggest, from Babylon, and they'd seen the similarity between the star and the messianic star, which was mentioned in Numbers 24, verse 7, that a star, Messiah, would arise out of Jacob. And so, I think they were looking for Messiah. And yet, they're called here magos, sorcerers, magic men. And I think that that's the image that they presented to Herod. And so here you have yet another example of where the Bible, especially I think uh, in the Gospels, uh, is written from the, the perspective of the people who are uh, mentioned there. But this is how they seemed. They seemed like a bunch of magic men, uh, sorcerers, and so this is how, they, uh, how they're, they're recorded, as being like that. And of course, you see this very clearly in the whole language of demons when demons don't actually exist, and yet the language of demons is used to describe the, the, the cures that, that were done. And so <clears throat> I think that they inevitably connect with the wise men of Babylon, amongst whom Daniel was one. Uh, back in, in Daniel 2.48, uh, clearly this group continued in Babylon. Not all the Jews returned from Babylon uh, to, to the land, and it seems to me that this was a, a group of Jews who were looking for the, the coming of Messiah. And the huge effort that they made to come all the way from the east to uh, Bethlehem and to give these very expensive presents to the king of Israel, uh, it seems to me that these were not just sorcerers. Why would they have done that? Why make the effort? Why take all the risk that they took to carry all those uh, valuable things, um, all that way. And then to give them away to a little child uh, born in a stable uh, whose parents were clearly not wealthy. He didn't exactly cut the image of a, a great king who they were going to get blessed from keeping in with. No, uh, these were not just sorcerers. These were people who had a genuine uh, commitment to the king of Israel. And it seems to me the connections with the the star of Jacob of Numbers 24, 17, and the, the wise men uh, who were Jews in Babylon, of whom Daniel was, was one uh, some generations previously. Now, it, it seems to me that these people were Jews who were searching for their Messiah. Now, the star didn't take them directly to Bethlehem. It seems that it disappeared for a while. And so they went to Jerusalem, assuming that this king of Israel was going to be born there. And they go and rather naively ask Herod, so where's the king of, where's the little boy who's been born, the king of Israel? So I don't think the guidance that they were given, nor that God gives us, is continual. It wasn't every day, and there are some, some kind of gaps in the whole thing, where a, there's an apparent silence of God within those gaps. And we have to continue the journey in faith. I think that's the, that's the message. Now, why were they ignorant of Micah 5 verse 2, that Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem? Well, the fact that they had searched the scriptures and had come to the conclusion that, yes, Jesus was to be, be born there, the Messiah was to be, uh, was to be born in, in Israel uh, around that time, that doesn't mean that they necessarily understood absolutely everything. So their knowledge was incomplete, like it is with all of us. And yes, I think they had missed Micah 5 verse 2 and the connection with, uh, with Bethlehem. Now, stars don't move across the sky in a way that can be followed 
on earth in this way, uh, let alone not over a, a period of days, weeks, months. So again, as we made the point, it seems to me that uh, they're being, uh, events are being described as they appeared to, to people on earth. And that's, as I say, the, the same with calling them magos, calling them magic men, when I suggest they actually weren't that. Now, <clears throat> it's also clear then that this star that they saw was not a star. It appeared as a star, but the fact that eventually it, it pinpoints a single uh, dwelling on Earth, uh, this is not a, a star as we know it. This is very clearly um, a special star from, from God. So they they uh, say verse 2, where is he that is born the king of the Jews? Some kings become kings by revolution or by war, and others are born kings because they're born into the kingly line. So again, I think you, you see an indication here that these, these wise men uh, understood that this Messiah, this king of Israel, was born into, was going to be born into the line of David. They understood the implications of the promises to, to David. Verse 3, Herod was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. He was upset at the idea that Messiah could be born. And yet, Luke 2 verse 10 says that the birth of Messiah was to be a time of joy to all people. And yet, when he's, he's born, or the, with the news of his birth, Herod and, quote, all Jerusalem are troubled. They don't like it. And yet the, the despised and lowly shepherds, who were seen, uh, shepherds were seen as generally uh, unreliable people, some, somehow uh, uh, cunning and uh, not honest, uh, etc., these despised people rejoiced with great joy when they heard that uh, Messiah had been born. And yet Herod and all Jerusalem, and I think all Jerusalem means the, the Jerusalem leadership, they were troubled. And uh, of course, in passing, all Jerusalem isn't literally everybody in Jerusalem, because there were some in the city, according to Luke 2.38, who were awaiting with joy the, the news of the, the birth of Messiah. So when you read about all, in the Bible, you sometimes have to have to take that as qualified and not not literally. But the point is that for the humble and for the spiritually minded, this was a cause of great joy. But for Jerusalem's leadership, the Jewish leadership and, and Herod, this was very troubling. And so this is how it so often is that when God acts, people respond in one of two ways. There's joy by the spiritually minded, and there's troubled attitudes by others. So often it happens when uh, we announce the, the news of a baptism somewhere. There's quite naturally joy in the minds of the spiritually minded, but in the naysayers, there is uh, trouble and uh, upset that, oh, huh, they've gone and baptized someone else. You never guess what they've gone and done. They've gone and baptized someone in, I don't know, such and such a town or city. Um, to the spiritually minded, this, this is a matter of joy. To, to those who are not, this is trouble. This is taken negatively. So verse 4, he gathers together, Herod gathers together, the chief priests and scribes of the people. Now, you notice that the priests here are called the priests of the people, and I think that's significant, because in the Old Testament, the priests are always called the priests of Yahweh. But here they're called the priests of the people. And, of course, there, there was, biblically, only one high priest. But at that time, the Jews were so jealous about who was going to be the high priest. There was so much political infighting, they ended up with having about four of them concurrently at the same time. This reminds me of how, in John's Gospel, particularly, whenever there's a Jewish feast, and there's a number of them, uh, it's called a feast of the Jews. But in the Old Testament, they're always called the feasts of Yahweh, the feasts of the Lord. It's the same with the synagogue of the Jews. That's another phrase you encounter in the Gospels. So, I think the point that we get from this, the feasts of Yahweh have become the feasts of the Jews, 
the priests, or even the high priest, of Yahweh had become the priest of the people. The people had hijacked, had hijacked God's religion and turned it into their own. Now, we can do that so easily that we can not accept his truth for what it is, but hijack it to, as it were, just meet our own basic human religious needs, rather than it being his truth and his work. It's the same with the repeated Bible teaching in the New Testament of the Lord's table, that we are here at the table of the Lord, that we are desperate sinners who have come to, to be accepted by grace and are sitting here awed uh, by his grace at his table. And yet so often one hears it said in so many words or by implication, we can't have him at our table. Couldn't dirty our table. Our table is not open to such people. So what we've done, we've hijacked the Lord's table and turned it into our table. And this is exactly what the Jews did. The feasts of Yahweh and the priests of Yahweh became the priests of the people and the feasts of the Jews. So he says to them, verse 4, where is uh, he demanded of them where Christ should be born, born, and that's the Greek word geneo, from whence Genesis. So quite clearly, uh, the Messiah, Jesus, was created. He was gendered, if you like, beginning with within the womb of Mary. And that's pretty clear that there's no way that he pre-existed uh, in, a, in a personal form, as is required by the Trinity and so forth, uh, before that time. So he asked them where the Christ should be born. So he understood, Herod understands, that these wise men are seeking the Christ. They're seeking the Messiah. So as I say, I don't think they were just magos. They weren't just uh, sorcerers, uh, just wandering around from the east looking for some significant king. Verse 6. You, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a governor. So then, you are not the least. In other words, Bethlehem was seen, in some sense, as the least. And yet, the word of prophecy had said, you are not the least. Because Jesus shall, you know, the Messiah shall come out of you. And again, the language of, <clears throat> out of you shall come. A governor. This again is uh, uh, bad news for those who believe in a personal pre-existence. Not out of heaven did come the, the governor who shall rule my people Israel, but out of Bethlehem. But my point is that God loves to work like this. He loves to choose those things and people and places that are most despised in the eyes of men, and he loves to use them. This is his style. This is the I would say the, the hallmark of the divine, that he is involved here. When you see him loving to work through a place like Bethlehem, and his prophecy says, you are not the least, yeah, you are seen as the least, but you are not the least because out of you shall come forth God's Son. And so in verse 8, he sent them to Bethlehem. Don't forget, the star, it seemed, had disappeared. And there was this gap in divine guidance and the divine leading of these people. There they were, they'd, they'd been led all the way to, to Israel, they come to Jerusalem and they ask, well, where's the king? Because they thought that he'd be born in the capital city. And no, uh, he's not there. They drew a blank. And then they meet this king and he says, go to Bethlehem. And uh, go and uh, bring me word again. And so off they trot uh, to, to Bethlehem, following the command of the king. And then verse 9, then they see the, the star again. And therefore, verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. You can understand that. They maybe spent all their money on this trip and getting these valuable presents. And they come all the way to, to Jerusalem. And then a star disappears. And they think, well, yeah, we're here. No, uh, no child, uh, no one seems to know anything about it. Okay, they meet this king, and he sends us off to Bethlehem. Off they trot to this place called Bethlehem, where they had 
uh, never been, and oh, wow, there's a star. Now, isn't that typical of how God leads us? In the period where God is silent, where the star disappears, in that gap, in that period, in a human life, you can sense that I am alone, that he's left me. That, oh, yeah, it was good back then in the old days when I felt God leading me, but now it's all disappeared. And then suddenly the star appears again. Suddenly you sense again divine guidance and leadership in your life. Now, that is typical, as I say, of how God works with people. He is leading each of us to, to his son. So then, they brought to her, verse 11, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, in classical literature of the time, those are the three gifts that are typically offered to, to kings. And there are several references to kings at the time being presented with those three gifts. So the extent of these men's conviction that this was the king of Israel was very great. Now, we may all put our hand up and say, yes, I believe Jesus is Lord. If I say to you, do you believe Jesus is Lord? Put your hand up. Yes, I believe Jesus is Lord. But, you know what? That demands an awful lot of us. It really does. It demanded of uh, the woman in the city who was a sinner, everything that she had, Mary Magdalene or whoever, um, giving her valuable uh, box of ointment, her spikenard, uh, to the Lord because she accepted that he was the Christ. If he is the anointed one, I must anoint him. It was not painless to say Jesus is not just Jesus, he is the Christ, he is the anointed one for her because she had to anoint him and she paid dearly for that. And it's the same here. To say, yeah, Jesus is king, Jesus is Lord, king of kings. Yeah, well, for these guys, it took them a huge amount of traveling, nerves, worry, and a lot of money to give him the obedience that is his due. Now, in our lives it may not be gold, frankincense and myrrh, but the bottom line is that if he is Lord, if he is absolute master and absolute king in human life, this demands actually all that we have. Money, nerves, traveling, the whole structure of human life is towards him. Now, you notice here on the record uh, an absence at this point of any reference to Joseph. His amazing obedience uh, and immediacy of response to, to God's word wasn't rewarded by any permanent recognition in a human sense. And that's what I like about Joseph. Because true service of, of God is very often like that. There is no recognition in this life. And people sometimes get upset that there isn't that, oh, well, I did this, that, and the other in the, uh, in the ecclesia and the church for, for so long, and, you know, no one even noticed them, da, da, da. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can believe that. That's how it is. But that's the whole point, that we shall be recognized in the world to, to come. And you don't get it in this life. They were warned, verse 12, of God in a dream. But the Greek word really means to to be answered. So it seems that they were praying to God for guidance, and now they got it. Now, they departed uh, the way that he told them to another country. And actually, the next night, the same thing happens in essence to Joseph. An angel appears to him. He gets an angelic message, just like the wise men did, and he is told to depart to another country, and he goes immediately. So then, the obedience of the wise men, I think, was set up that day, that night, as an example for Joseph and Mary to follow. That just that night, the wise men got the message, they must have said to Joseph and Mary, you know what, uh, we got a, a message from angels, uh, that we got to go immediately. And uh, to another country, not the way that we know, uh, and we got to do it immediately. Bye, we're, we're gone. Next night, same thing happens to Joseph. Angel appears, Joseph, get the, get the child and, and the mother, go, straight away to Egypt. I know you don't know the way, you've not been there before, but go, I'm telling you. And he gets up and goes. Now, that is exactly what happens so often in, in our lives, that 
the situations that we experience in essence repeat in the lives of others and have repeated both biblically and in, in terms of the contemporary people that we know. And what that is designed for is so that we should learn obedience. That's why sometimes in reading the scriptures you can find that in essence somebody was in the same position as you are. And the day you read that, you are taught that, and then the next day you, you're put to the test yourself. Or, and this is the whole value of fellowship with each other, what it can be that someone is in a bad place, bad situation in, in your group of uh, acquaintance within the, the church, within the ecclesia, and you see somebody setting a good example of obedience or going through something, and the next day, the next week, the next month, maybe the next year, it's you. It's your turn to struggle with what they struggled with. And their obedience was your example, and it can even be that their failure is your warning. So everything in life is controlled very beautifully. But you see, if you opt out of fellowship with your brothers and sisters, well, you don't have an option, you don't have the opportunity to see that, at least not so clearly. And that is, as I say, the reason for fellowship. So that we learn from each other and we see how circumstances repeat uh, between human lives. And it is experience, common experience in the end, which binds us together in fellowship, more, far more so than agreement with uh, a set of theology. So then, in verses 13 and 14 there, as soon as they were departed, the angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream. And maybe you could uh, uh, say the emphasis is on the word Joseph. It's in verse 12, they were warned of God in a dream not to return to Herod. And now the angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream, saying, uh, Arise and take the young child. Verse 14, he arose. He took the young child and his mother and departed. It's set up to show his exact obedience, exact to the word obedience immediately. Now, I think the idea of um, <clears throat> immediate response to God is, is worth dwelling on. I, I love the story of um, Rebecca, when you remember how Abraham's servant comes and says, I'm taking uh, a wife for Isaac, and uh, it was clearly meant to be that she went, and her family say, well, why don't you just stay for 10 days or so, and I think it over, and uh, they say, okay, well, we'll ask, and the, uh, the servant says, no, no, let, let's take her immediately. And they say, well, no, let's ask the girl. I say, Rebecca, what do you want to do? Do you want to go immediately? Or do you want to wait 10 days? And she says, I will go. And when you come to the Acts of the Apostles, you have this uh, phenomenon, almost, of immediate baptisms, that people responded immediately. The jailer in, uh, in Acts 16 in, in Philippi is a classic example. So, when you get the, the sense that I should do something, do it, and do it immediately. <clears throat> now, the voice of the flesh and the voice of people who uh, reason according to the flesh will say, oh, no, no, wait, wait, wait. Uh, now, let's balance it all out, think about it, don't do it on the cusp of emotion, uh, etc. I agree, not on the cusp of emotion, but if you seriously understand that this is the way that I'm supposed to go, then go, and go immediately. Because the longer you wait, this is how the flesh works, uh, we tend to start balancing everything up and trying to come to uh, some balanced situation. We try, we, we try to come to a position whereby, well, actually, I won't do it uh, right now. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it next week. I'll do it when my life situation allows me to. And in the end, you never do it. Or well, you don't do it as you should do. <coughs> now... <coughs> You notice also that um, when he leaves Egypt to come back, um, the, the whole situation repeats. You can see that um, in verses 20 and 21. Uh, again, verse 19, the angel of the Lord appears in a dream to Joseph and says, Arise, to the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Egypt. Verse 21, and he arose and did this. So you see then that circumstances repeated, not only between the life of Joseph and the wise men, but also within the life of Joseph. 
that at some point after he'd come to Egypt, the whole thing repeated. Uh, in a dream, at night, a vision, arise, let's get up right away, because it's night when he's having the dream, arise, get up right away, take the young child and his mother and depart, and make the long journey to another land. And he does it. And so there is, I think, a sense of deja vu in our lives. This sense, I have been here before. This sense that, yes, in essence, I have seen this. In essence, I have been here. Yeah, that's right. Like a good teacher, God repeats the exercise sometimes. Not just for the sake of it, but to underline to us. Even if you pass the test the first time, you still repeat it so that you learn. And this is a, a wonderful encouragement because the worst thing is to sense that my life is meaningless. The worst thing is to sense that I am in the hands of fate. The worst thing is to not be able to attach a meaning to event in human life. And we can't always do that to the end, I accept. But what we can perceive, I think, is that definitely, definitely God is working. Definitely. He is here with us and alive and active in our lives. Now, he, he's told back in verse 13 to flee to Egypt <clears throat> because Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Now, here's a question. If Joseph hadn't been obedient, Herod, it seems, would have destroyed Jesus. Now, Joseph's obedience was not automatic. Otherwise, he was just a puppet. There's so many things like that that, that go, go on in, in, in life and have gone on in God's history with humanity. Whereby if, for example, Israel had accepted Jesus as their Messiah, as clearly was God's intention, you know, they beat up all my prophets, my servants, but I will send them my son, surely they will reverence my son. Uh, if they had done that, which was clearly God's intention, the whole prophetic program and the divine program would have worked out very differently, would it not? Now, it's because of that that I believe that prophecy, in, the, in its predictive sense, is open, is absolutely open, because so much depends upon human response. Verse uh, 14, sorry, 15. He was there in Egypt until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Well, I would say that that is not strictly according to the context. When you go back to Hosea, you know, he, he says there that he had called his son out of Egypt, but the more I called him, the less he came to me. He, he didn't want to uh, respond. So it would appear that this is quoting somewhat out of context, and yet Matthew sees it as a fulfillment of prophecy. And in fact, if you go through uh, the way Matthew particularly uses the Old Testament and says, hey, this fulfilled such and such an Old Testament prophecy, it really seems very often that actually he's out of context. We may not have time, but uh, 17 and 18, uh, is a classic when uh, Herod goes and kills all the, all the children and the mothers are weeping and he says then was fulfilled what, Jer what Jeremiah said in Ramah was there a voice heard lamentation and weeping great mourning Ra Rachel weeping for her children because they were not this is not an in context quotation so we have said and I suppose said rightly to some extent that context is so important in interpreting the Bible and it, it is to some extent but actually not, not totally, because it seems that the Jewish me uh, method of midrash, of commentary, was to take just some words that had occurred in the Old Testament, take them out of that context and say, ah, oh, yeah, and those words as words had a strange fulfillment here in, in this context. 
even though if you go back to the original context in the Old Testament, look at the verses before and after, it, it's not in context. And so I think that that's what Matthew's doing. And I think why he, he particularly does it is because he's appealing to Jewish people. This Gospel of Matthew is the transcript of the Gospel that Matthew normally preached. And he was preaching to Jewish people, I imagine, in Palestine, uh, soon after the ascension of the Lord Jesus. And so he was reasoning with them in their terms. He was saying, look, oh yeah, you remember those couple of words um, out of some prophecy in the Old Testament? Uh, yeah, oh, don't you see how it's a strange similarity with, with what happened with Jesus? Even though if you go back to that Old Testament passage and look at the verses before and after, it doesn't seem to fit the context. So I'm just raising a caveat there. The context is not always everything. It was not everything in, in Jewish Midrash, in Jewish interpretation, and it's not used uh, in that way. The, the, the Midrash system of commentary seems to be used under inspiration here in the, in the New Testament. Verse 16, <clears throat> Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceedingly angry and went forth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. According to the time. I think that um, that must mean that he had asked them, when did you first see this star? And the answer was two years ago. And therefore, he killed all the children from two years old and under. So when did this star first appear two years ago? And you say the star is the messianic star of, 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 of Jacob, of Messiah. Okay. Uh, and it appeared two years ago. So you mean like maybe the child was born two years ago? Mm-hmm. So the message you get from that, I think, is that the wise men were on this journey for two years. It may have been that they first uh, decided to make the journey two years before, and it took them time to gather money, to make the plans, to buy gold, frankincense, and myrrh, uh, and so forth. In which case, this shows a tremendous commitment by them. You can understand well, when they got to Jerusalem, when the star disappeared, they were so disappointed. And then they were so happy when Herod says, hey, can you just go to Bethlehem for me? And they say, yeah, okay. Off they go to Bethlehem, and on the way, oh, wow, there's a star. The star's appeared again. You understand why it says in verse 10, they rejoiced uh, with exceeding great joy. You can understand that. Uh, so for two years, they've been doing this. They've been making this plan. And again, you see the commitment that arises from a conviction that Jesus is Lord, that he is the king of Israel. This is not a painless thing to, to accept. It's, it costs us something. Now, he thought that he was mocked by them. I don't get the impression that the wise men mocked him. I get the impression that they feared him and that they simply obeyed what God said to them that night. Get up and go back another way. But Herod perceives that they were mocking him. And so the record states things from the perspective of how he saw it just as these men are called magos in, uh, <clears throat> in verse 1. Uh, they're called magicians, sorcerers. Well, they, they weren't that, but that's how they were seen and perceived. So the Bible is written, and this is particularly true of the, the Genesis record of creation, etc. It's written from the standpoint of someone here on earth, according to our uh, perceptions uh, and perspectives. And so because he thought he had been mocked, actually he got the wrong end of the stick, but that's how he, he thought, it says he was angry and he goes and kills all these children. He takes out his anger on these little children. This is actually a, cl a classic of uh, human psychology, and the Bible is great like that. The Bible reveals to us the, the essence of what we need to know about, uh, about human psychology. So he perceived that he had been mocked. And so he's angry with the wise men because he thinks you're just mocking me. He's angry with them. And so he takes out his anger on little children. 
he transfers his anger with the wise men onto the kids. Now, let's imagine you're in a supermarket this morning and, and you're there at the till and the woman behind the till is absolutely rude to you. She's so angry with you. And you think, look, woman, I'm just standing here like buying something. What's your problem with me? What do you go off the deep end at me for? I'm just a guy standing here buying my, my, my shopping. Yeah. Probably, last night, she perceived that uh, she was being mocked or used or laughed at or had fun poked at her by, I don't know, her partner, boyfriend, father, mother, neighbour, whatever. And so she's angry with that person, but they've gone. Or she can't show the anger to that person or whatever. And there you are unhappy man that I am, standing in front of her, and the anger is on me, or on you, unhappy person that you are, you, you know what I'm saying. Um, and this happens all the time. So many times people say, oh, he said this to me, she shouted that at me. I don't know why, I, I never said nothing. I, I did nothing wrong to that person. Why are they taking out on me? You yeah, know, no. is it hard to understand? It's transference. They're angry over something else, and you just happen to be in the way. And so they took it out on you, because you're the guy standing in front of them. And so it was with Herod. He perceived, and he perceived wrongly anyway, uh, as again often happens, that he was being mocked. So he's angry with the wise men. Oh, but they're gone. They're out of town, never to be seen again. All right. I will take out my anger against a bunch of kids. And this is what happens so often. It really does. Now, be aware then of this issue about transference. And actually, we could go a bit further in this. It often happens that people are angry with themselves for their own sin. And they realize that I should be punished for my sin. So I will transfer that anger and that desire for judgment onto someone else. This is why, for example, you, you can see uh, maybe leading uh, brothers who maybe you know up there, up front, etc., leading their community, and they're having an affair. And underneath, they know that that's wrong, and they're they're angry uh, with themselves over that. And how can I fall into this situation? They realise that should be judged. That they should be judged, and without realising it, they transfer it onto some other bloke. This young couple, uh, madly in love with each other, all plan to get married, and well, unfortunately she, she becomes pregnant. Man, let's throw the book at them. You this, you that, you whore, you blah, blah, blah. And uh, the poor people are chucked out of the church, never to be seen again. And uh, then a couple of years later it all comes out, but you, buddy, were having an affair. How could you? Yeah, quite simple. That shouldn't shock us because it's a classic of transference. This is going on all the time, and it particularly happens with religious people. This is why people, are sort of their, their jaw drops when, when they see some of the, uh, the hypocrisy in, uh, in Christian leadership and in Christians generally, and they're amazed. How could you? How could the guy say that, do that, when he was this, that, and the other? Yeah, quite simple. Once you get this idea of the transference of, of anger and a, of a desire for judgment, you transfer it onto someone else. And this is what Herod did. It's an absolute classic. Absolutely. For us, all the wrath and all the anger has been met in the cross. Judgment has been done, actually, in one sense, in a theological sense. And Jesus is the guilt offering. All that guilt has been taken away, has been put upon his head as the fulfillment of the scapegoat. That it's gone. And we don't need, we don't need to, to have that guilt, that anger with ourselves, that, uh, that, that desire to judge and condemn ourselves and then just get rid of it by transferring it onto someone else. No. It's been in that sense that the, the judgment has been transferred. Not onto anyone else, but onto the head of the Lord Jesus. And that is the whole uh, message, I would say, of the, of the cross of Jesus.
Now, in verse uh, 20, we read then that after they'd been in Egypt for a while, uh, again, the circumstances repeat. The angel appears in a dream, uh, just as it happened before, and says to Joseph, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go into another land. And he does this immediately. And they are dead, verse 20, which sought the young child's life. It was not just Herod. We pointed out in verse 3 that Herod and all Jerusalem, that is all the Jerusalem leadership, were troubled with him. So it wasn't just Herod, there was this group of, uh, of people. Now the implication could be that he had no other information apart from that uh, Herod had died. Uh, Joseph had no other information. And so he comes to the border, I imagine, with Israel. And verse 22, he hears that Archelaus is reigning in Judea in the place of his father Herod. And he gets uh, frightened. He's frightened to, to go on when he hears that. And I think, therefore, that God makes a concession to his weakness. Because, therefore, it says, verse 22, uh, he was warned of God in a dream to turn aside into the parts of Galilee. He came and dwelt in the city called Nazareth. Now, I would say that it was perhaps God's intention that they should return to the land of Israel and live, maybe, in Jerusalem. And so he's told to go back uh, to, to Israel, and he obeys, but then he hears, somewhere on the journey, that actually Herod's son is reigning, and he thinks, oh, yeah, he was just as bad as his father. And so he's fearful to go, even though God has said in the dream, they, not just Herod, but they are dead who sought the child's life. So God is saying, look, Archelaus isn't actually seeking the child's life. He said, they are all dead who were seeking the child's life. So he goes, then, oh, Archelaus is reigning, but he's Herod's son. Ah, oh, surely he's going to try and kill the child. No. God has said, no, they're all dead who were trying to kill the child. Now, God doesn't say, you know, sorry, Joseph, you didn't believe what I said. See you later. I'll find another way to raise my child. He says, okay. Um, he's told, therefore, to go uh, and dwell in, in a remote part of Galilee. Galilee was sort of the, the back end of Palestine. Uh, it was known for having a, a lot of Gentiles living there. It was really uh, that despised Nazareth. I mean, it really was. Uh, and so, okay, there's another plan. Now, uh, when we're told uh, that he turned aside, verse 22, into, the, into Galilee, this is the same word that's usually translated, he withdrew himself. It's used about uh, the judges withdrawing themselves in Acts 26, verse 31. <clears throat> it's used about Jesus several times withdrawing into a desert place, Matthew 14, verse 13. Uh, he withdrew from the crowds when they wanted to crown him king, as used several times like that. The idea is, I think, that he withdrew into isolation. So th that's why I suggest putting all this together. But the ideal was that he went to Jerusalem and raised a child in Jerusalem. But God says, no, uh, okay, you, that was my idea, but you're, you're scared of Archelaus. Well, you don't need to be scared of Archelaus, but okay, you can't quite cope with the idea. Okay, you, you go and live in Galilee. And he does so, and he lives in Nazareth, verse 23, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. He should be called a Nazarene. Well, as has been pointed out many times, um, <clears throat> there is not really any prophecy that says that. There are prophecies that clearly say that Messiah is to be despised. Get that very clearly in uh, Isaiah 53 and so forth. And... Nazareth was almost uh, another word for a place where people are despised. <clears throat> That's why later on they say, well, out of, that there couldn't possibly be a prophet coming out of Nazareth. Nazareth it was just like the, the pits. There can't be such a place. And uh, therefore I, I suggest that... <clears throat> This is uh, what we might call a bit of a stretch, to say that it's written in the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Uh, it's written in the prophets that he will be despised, 
And, uh, well, he goes lives in Nazareth, and Matthew says, oh, yeah, well, so that, that fulfills the idea that, well, he was a Nazarene, therefore he was despised. Well, why the apparent stretch? Well, here's the thing, which speaks over the centuries right to my life and to your life. God has a plan for us. That we should do this, we should go live in this place, or that we, we, we should be such a person, or whatever. And we don't do it. We're not against, we start on the way, but then, ah, no, I can't. No, no, I'm scared. Just like Joseph, I'm scared. Archelaus, he's the son of Herod, and he's, he's in power now. That's bad news for me. God said it, don't worry. All those that are seeking uh, the child's life are dead. You don't have to worry about Archelaus. Oh, but I do. Oh, I can't. I just can't. Okay. Then God says, look here, here's a plan B. Here's a plan C. Here's a plan D. You go and do that. So, okay, he does it. Um, and God will work, even if it means stretching, stretching, if you like, as it seems to me this uh, mention here of Jesus being a Nazarene, according to the prophets, even stretching here his own envelope, as it were, stretching the boundaries uh, within which he works with people, stretching the fulfillment of his word somewhat, he will work like that, because he so wants to work with you. If I was so up myself as to write an autobiography, I would call it Plan D, seeing that, you know, my name's Duncan, uh, D for Duncan. In the sense that I, I see this so often, that, you know, here's the ideal. Either I or someone else uh, didn't get to it, so there was another plan, Plan B, with God, and that also didn't make it Plan C, okay, and then you come down to Plan D, you know, that, which is me. And I think the more you look at your life, the more you will see that. You, you see it very clearly with many people who've married unbelievers. Well, that's not the best. That was not plan A. No way. It doesn't mean that God says, oh, yeah, you didn't make it, so see you later. Um, no. Okay, there's a... All right. Let's work by plan B. Now, let, let's take somebody who marries an unbeliever. Well, all the Bible teaching about marriage, etc., is not really going to come true in their life uh, because it's uh, ideally you're talking about two believers that are married. Uh, you know, that the husband is, is to, to, to be the, uh, the manifestation of Jesus and the, the wife is to be the manifestation of the church and so forth. Well, that's pretty difficult if the guy doesn't even believe in Jesus. Okay, but God is still working in that life. And okay, the, the prophecies and the, the scriptures will not fit so snugly into your life as they would do if you had married a believer. But that's not to say that they don't fit at all. And this is, I think, a great example here. The idea, the ideal, was that he went and I think lived in Jerusalem and raised Jesus in Jerusalem. But okay, he got scared of Archelaus. God says, hey, you have to worry about Archelaus. Ah, oh, but I can't. Okay, then you go, uh, you go live up in the middle of nowhere, out in the boonies in Galilee, where you can be anonymous uh, from the, in a sense, um, compared to the, living in Jerusalem, uh, and you won't be under the, the gaze of Archelaus, etc. Okay, go, go, go up there. I'll, I'll let you do that. Oh, okay, you're going to do that? Oh, okay, and let's stretch somewhat uh, the prophecies, my own word, uh, to, to cover you there, so that actually, wow, this is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. That was all said and done with, with absolute integrity on God's part. An absolute integrity in inspiring Matthew to write this. Now, of course, if you've got a choice in service of God, we are not minimalists. We shouldn't be. If you love God, you want to serve him on the highest possible level. You're not just a minimalist trying to do the minimum and get away with the minimum. But because we are human, it ends up with plan B, plan C, and even plan D. And yet God wants to work with us. Now, if he is so... Uh, eager to work with us, we also should be eager to work with others without putting all sorts of hoops and uh, etc. in their way that they've got to jump through before we're going to before we're going to engage with them and work with them. The point is, God wants you and me. He wants to work with us, and He did this with Joseph, and He leads Joseph all the way through, and Joseph really does well. He responds with weakness, 
But all the same, who responds? Just like the, the wise men, they were being led by the star. The star disappeared, they didn't say, oh, hang, uh, you know, that was all just an imagination in our head. Uh, God's a deceiver, he's with you, then he's, he's gone just when you critically need him. No, God appeared again. Yes, use Herod to send them, just push them on the way to Bethlehem, uh, to guide them in a way that they were not accustomed to, because they were accustomed to following the star. Uh, and in the end, they got there to Jesus, the King and Lord of their lives.